joining us on this, uh, on this drizzly morning. Um, as we uh, gather to celebrate and honor the work of our friend, colleague, sister, Tani Adams, Tani uh, was a master at building networks and combining resources, and so many of the institutions and individuals who became part of an enormous ecosystem um, that surrounded Tani's work are represented here today. Her family, first and foremost, um, friends from Guatemala and from Mexico, thank you, Mike Conroy, from coming and from Oaxaca, um, our partners at the Inter-American Foundation, who, like CEPAL and the Universidad Landivar in Guatemala and the U.S. Institute of Peace here in Washington and so many others provided support and the enabling environment for Tani to carry out her pathbreaking work. We are really grateful as I think back to have had Tani with us as a public policy scholar as she was beginning this process in 2009 upon her move from Guatemala to Washington and to have participated over a period of several years um, in this process as her work evolved to ever and ever higher levels of sophistication. Um, I'm especially grateful to Kim Krasovic, who I think is here um, from, there she is, thank you, from the Ford Foundation um, and to the Institute for International Education, who have made the actual hard copy publication of Tani's book possible. Um, this was a manuscript that she worked on literally um, until the, the final days of her life and that we were privileged uh, to publish online last year. The backdrop of today's discussion um, is in a very twisted way, both really fitting um, as well as horrific, as we all know. Um, ripping children from their parents at the U.S.-Mexico border, warehousing thousands of them away from their caregivers and loved ones is precisely a form of the chronic violence that Tani sought to understand and remedy, and psychologists and pediatricians whenever have talked about the impact um, of this, um, uh, uh, of taking children from their parents and the long-term impact that that's gonna have on their lives. Those of us who work on citizen security typically focus mostly on the policies that can be adopted at the national or the local level to address problems of crime and violence. Tani looked for a more holistic approach one that was embedded in a concept of human development that started with the individual, indeed at the earliest moments of the bond between an infant and its mother, and proceeded from that micro level to concentric circles of community, society, nation, and, and the world. Um, Tani was trying to make sense in many ways of what she had directly experienced and observed in post-war Guatemala. And typically, um, a true Renaissance woman, she combined numerous disciplines, of course, her own discipline of anthropology, but also psychology, sociology, political economy, to develop a more conscious and critical understanding of the impact of violence on human development, and therefore, the multi-tiered interventions that are needed to create societies in which human beings can flourish. Tani's book, which I hope all of you will take copies of, is not an easy read. Um, just like just about everything else in her life, um, she tested boundaries and challenged all of us to move beyond our comfort zones of what we thought we knew and understood. But it is really essential reading, uh, especially for practitioners who some of whom are, are joining us now from Central America via webcast, um, who daily with commitment and patience are seeking to address the astronomical levels of violence in Latin America and elsewhere in the world. I'd like to, before turning over the microphone to Paloma Adams, the director of the Inter-American Foundation, who is joining us and co-sponsoring today's event, I'd like to thank and um, say a word of appreciation to my colleagues in the Latin American program, Deputy Director Eric Olson, who will be moderating um, this panel, uh, Program Associate Jacqueline Dolezal, who leaves at the end of today to get ready for her wedding uh, next week, um, as well as our dedicated interns, Carly, who is also leaving us today uh, to go off and do a PhD at Cambridge University, um, Sam, who's somewhere wandering around, but everybody in our, in our own lab family who have made uh, this possible. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you for the warm welcome, colleagues from Wilson Center. Um, I will be quite brief. Um, I did not know Tani personally. I didn't have a chance to meet her or the privilege to meet her. But I knew of her, pr first through my work at USAID, where they we benefited from her research in chronic violence um, and started to incorporate that in CARSI. And most recently, when I joined the Inter-American Foundation, um, she was on the lips of a lot of our colleagues, particularly as we expanded our work into the Northern Triangle in Central America, thinking about how we address chronic violence programmatically um, as a human development challenge and how we address it operationally in the communities in which we try to work. Um, Tani came to the IAF at a moment when we really were beginning to wrestle with the challenges of violence. We were hearing from our grantees how it's impacting their lives. We ourselves were having challenges accessing communities whom we'd worked with historically because of the issues of violence. And we were addressing it on an ad hoc basis as issues came up, but we weren't looking at it as a development challenge. And our mandate as the American Foundation is really to work with grassroots organizations to surface their solutions to development challenges and to help them repair and build the fabric of society. And we realized that violence was really ripping at that fabric and we were not gonna have the impact we wanted to have if we didn't really address this in a programmatic way. And so Tani found us and brought to us her ideas, this research, and gave us this incredible tool and framework that we could embrace and bring to our grantees and start to operationalize with them, how they could acknowledge the different streams of violence in their lives, how those were interrelated to become um, a sort of systematic challenge, and how they could create spaces to safely start to address that. Um, and that really was, for us, an incredible service that she provided us. And so we continue today to use her framework in our programming. We are, we're um, programming more and more in Central America, in Colombia, um, and across a region where violence continues and, and protracted violence continues to affect communities. And so we really live with her legacy every day, and we're thankful and grateful to have known her and continue to celebrate her and are proud of the work she did. So we really wanted to take today to recognize her, to thank her family and all of you who supported her and worked with her, and to make sure that you know that we continue, to, we will continue to build on this framework and we hope to learn today from this panel other ways that we can really try to operationalize and internalize this. So thank you for having us. Welcome all of you who are here. And I will now turn it over to Eric Olson. Thank you all very much. I am going to invite our panelists to come on up here and take a seat, uh, and we'll get things rolling in just a minute. I want to thank again Paloma and our colleagues. Come, come on up. You know, don't be bashful. Um, thank uh, uh, Paloma and our friends and colleagues at the IAF for their coming. Again, a word of appreciation and gratitude to Gina Adams uh, for coming. Uh, we're honored to have you here. I know that your mother and father would have loved to have been here, but distance and health reasons made that impossible. Um, and of course, we convey our love to, to Tani's children as well. So thank you all for being here. And if you give us a second, I think, is Claudia Poss here yet? <laughs> she got delayed. So I think we're just going to go ahead and start. And then when she arrives, we'll integrate her into the panel. Thank you. I think I'm going to sit down here because I have just a couple of slides and I don't want my bald head to get in the way of your, your view. So even though I'm not Claudia Paz, um, I'll go ahead. Give me just a second. Um, so I don't want to belabor uh, what's already been said, but uh, um, obviously in addition to Tani being a friend and a colleague and a wonderful person that added a great deal of joy and life to this uh, place, uh, which needs a lot of joy and life, to be honest with you. So uh, we were glad to have her here. But we wanted to also uh, acknowledge uh, her wonderful work. And uh, so we want to take a few minutes 
to look a little more closely at some of what Tani Adams did, her contribution to our understanding of complexities of violence and the impact that uh, this has on people's life over time. And I think that's an important element. In her last work, Tani developed what she called the, the Chronic Violence Human Development Framework, and we've heard it mentioned. I hope you will take the book, take, have a chance to look at it. But in this framework, she sketches out the multiple sources and dimensions of violence in a person's life, from the very personal, what she called the micro, to the interpersonal, and the broader structural sources of violence uh, uh, that affect all of us. She also discusses the way in which these forms of violence build upon themselves, reproducing over time. Um, viewed in this way, the framework shifts our focus from the, the traditional approach of an individual act of violence, and we understand it more broadly in its broader context. <coughs> For example, it shifts, shifts the focus from uh, thematically and institutionally isolated or siloed approaches to dealing with violence to a more holistic uh, way and methods that are intersectorial, interdisciplinary, intergenerational, and, relation, uh, and relational in, uh, in nature. I wanted to just very briefly highlight some of the research we've done this, this year that deals with some of the aspects of this, that plays itself out. We had the privilege and an opportunity to conduct a whole series of studies uh, on crime and violence in the Americas uh, with the support of the Inter-American Development Bank. We commissioned studies uh, that were based uh, on uh, surveys of 8,000 uh, incarcerated people in eight countries in the Americas. And the surveys uh, helped us understand some of the risk factors uh, in their early childhood and how that might have contributed. Uh, and some of those factors uh, 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 suggested that there was an increased likelihood of a young girl being detained at a center for minors early in life, uh, being that she was more likely to be um, uh, criminally active in adulthood, and more, even more importantly, that there was more likelihood of repeat offenses or recidivism. And some of those risk factors include early childhood experiences with intrafamily violence, uh, problematic consumption, of drugs and alcohol, broken families, many cases broken families as a result of migration, and associations with friends who have also committed crimes. Those are all important risk factors. We also dug deeper into the issue of uh, childhood experiences with interfamily violence and found that these experiences are important indicators of potential future uh, criminal behavior what we've called the intergenerational transfer of violence from childhood to adulthood. Again, in the survey of 8,000 plus uh, prisoners, we found that 47% were direct victims of violence. In other <coughs> words, they experienced the violence themselves directly, and another 32% were indirect victims of violence, living in a household where there was brought, uh, like substantial or significant violence, uh, even though it might not be directed at them personally. The study also found interesting gender differences in these experiences, suggesting that uh, men and women or girls and boys experience uh, experience direct violence and, and, and become criminally active uh, at the same rates, but that the indirect violence in the household impacts women or young girls much more significantly than it does uh, young boys in the long run. So all of this data gives us some ideas, some new creative ways of thinking about violence in the region and how policymakers Sorry, it's hard to see. Uh, how policymakers may think about designing and developing new approaches for dealing with the problems of chronic violence in their work. Um, we are delighted to have a, a, a stellar panel of folks, uh, some of whom knew Tani personally, 
Some helped her develop her own uh, conceptual framework and all who have adopted her ideas in their own way and in their own work uh, in multiple arenas. Because of time constraints, I'm gonna just introduce each of them very briefly. I hope you will pick up the bios that are fuller that we have in the back, uh, or look at them online if you're, you're watching us online. Um, uh, oh, you arrived. <laughs> <laughs> I need, you snuck in the back door, I guess. <coughs> uh, so great, you're here. Uh, we are going to start start with, excuse me, uh, Claudia Pasipas. Dr. Pasipas was the first woman to serve as Attorney General of Guatemala and is currently the Secretary of Multidimensional Security at the Organization of American States. Then we'll hear from uh, Ms. Helen Mack. She's the president of the Myrna Mack Foundation, which she founded in 1993 with a group of like-minded Guatemalans committed to fighting impunity and contributing to the modernization and democratization of the administration of justice in Guatemala. Next we'll hear from, uh, I think we're gonna hear next from Gab Gabriela Leiva, uh, who is the citizen security specialist within the Democracy and Government's office at USAID in Honduras. Gabi is a Honduran national, but well known and recognized for her leadership and work in these areas. Uh, she is the coordinator for a citizen security portfolio at USAID, uh, mainly developing innovative approaches to the strategic application of the crime and violence programming in Honduras. And she helped, uh, and I hope she'll tell us a little bit about this, helped uh, 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 USAID and the CARSI pro program and strategy of the US government uh, to adopt and include some of these concepts that were developed by Connie. She'll help us understand that a bit. Uh, then we'll hear from Juanita Roca, uh, our, again our partner in this, uh, in this event from the Inter-American uh, Foundation. She's a representative, uh, foundation representative for Colombia and Chile. She coordinates the IAF IF's relations with Red E America, a network of corporate foundations that supports grassroots initiatives. Uh, before joining IAF in 2004, Juanita worked for Conservation International as technical director for the Healthy Communities Initiative, a grant program to evaluate the link between community well being and environment across 18 countries, not only in Latin America, but Asia and Africa. And then last, but not certainly not least, we'll hear from uh, Philip Thomas, also a close friend uh, of Tani's who helped in the development of her conceptual work. Uh, Philip has uh, uh, over 30 years of experience working across five continents in the field of conflict prevention, transformation, peace building, and democratic dialogue, as well as program design, monitoring, and evaluation, and I think Philip's going to help us think big thoughts about the future, where we can go with this. So thank you all very much for, for being with us. Uh, we will, they will make uh, opening remarks, and then we will have time at the end, I promise, for you all to ask questions and engage in dialogue. Uh, oh, if anybody needs <coughs> translation, this is going to be uh, bilingual. We do have uh, the devices. We have expert uh, translators in the back. Uh, so please raise your hand if you don't ha have a hearing device, listening device, and we will bring one to you. So let's start. Por favor, uh, Secretaria Claudia Paz y Paz, adelante. Bienvenida. Muchísimas gracias, Eric. Muy buenos días, Philip, Gabriela, Juanita, Helen. La verdad es que agradezco mucho la, la invitación del Wilson Center a comentar un, un trabajo tan, tan importante. Eh, quisiera iniciar solamente recordando brevemente cifras con las que estoy segura que todos ustedes están familiarizados. Cifras eh, que nos hablan de la, de la gravedad del problema que, que Tani puso sobre la mesa. Y es que en Latinoamérica, aunque concentramos 
el 8% de la población del mundo, también concentramos el 38% de los homicidios del mundo. Y tristemente, 43 de las 50 ciudades más violentas se encuentran en esta región, en América Latina. No en todos los países, por supuesto, El Salvador, iniciando por El Salvador, Venezuela, Honduras, Brasil, Guatemala, Colombia y México, concentran las tasas más altas de homicidio en América Latina y también la mayor cantidad de homicidios. Las víctimas, como ustedes saben, se concentran en jóvenes, varones, provenientes de estratos sociales que han sufrido exclusión por razones económicas, sociales, culturales. Las mujeres también, por supuesto, somos víctimas de violencia y en nuestro caso la violencia letal es solo el último ep episodio de una larga cadena de violencia que incluye la violencia psí física, psíquica, económica. Y un dato también importante para esta breve foto de la gravedad del problema es que el 70, más del 70% de los homicidios se producen con armas de fuego. Desde el punto de vista criminal, muchas de estas muertes violentas se encuentran asociadas y se vinculan con el crimen organizado especialmente, pero no solo el narcotráfico y en regiones urbanas en Centroamérica, se vinculan también con pandillas o maras aquí asociados a crímenes como el sicariato, la extorsión y el secuestro. Es decir, que nos estamos ante uno de los problemas más graves de la región. Sin embargo, a pesar de su gravedad, cuando se convive con la violencia por largos espacios de tiempo, y con tasas muy altas eh, de violencia, como señala Tani, esta tiende a naturalizarse, a invisibilizarse. Terminamos percibiéndola como algo normal, algo que ocurre en nuestras sociedades y quizás algo aún más grave, algo que no solo es normal, natural, <coughs> sino es algo inmutable, inalterable, algo que no podemos cambiar como ciudadanos, como individuos y frente a lo cual lo único que podemos hacer es eh, protegernos y una protección individual, salvarnos individualmente y Tani lo describe muy bien, sea encerrándonos, aislándonos, se instala un silencio social, un silencio colectivo, un miedo que por una parte es una respuesta natural a estos niveles de violencia, pero que también, como bien lo describe, puede generar más violencia, porque alimenta acciones como el vigilantismo por medio de juntas locales de seguridad o eh, la mal llamada limpieza social por empresas privadas de seguridad o los linchamientos o eh, la violencia institucional. Creo que uno de los eh, valores más importantes del trabajo de Tani es que nos invita a examinar este fenómeno que todos conocemos desde una mirada más comprensiva, a partir del concepto de violencia crónica, que es un, un concepto que se elaboró eh, luego de los trabajos en Guatemala y Colombia de Jenny Pierce, y que habla de tres factores o tres elementos. Uno es un aspecto cuantitativo, más o menos sería el doble del promedio de la tasa de homicidios de acuerdo con el nivel económico de cada país, más o menos sería 64 eh, homicidios por cada 100.000 habitantes, si a, hablamos de países en bajo estrato o 28.8, si hablamos de países de altos ingresos. Un elemento crucial en la definición es que debe ser sostenida en el tiempo por más de cinco años y otro es que se presenta en distintos espacios, la casa, el vecindario, la escuela, la comunidad, el espacio también nacional. 
sin duda el, el, el elemento cuantitativo es muy importante. Podemos discutir cómo establecemos el parámetro, cuándo estaríamos frente a la violencia crónica, cuándo deben saltar las alarmas, porque dadas eh, las altas tasas de homicidios en la región, de entrada ya estaríamos ante un parámetro sumamente alto. Sin embargo, por supuesto que coincido en el valor de tener justamente a, part a partir de acá esta violencia eh, debe ser eh, una prioridad en la agenda nacional, su prevención debe ser una prioridad en la agenda nacional. Si estamos hablando de violencia crónica, tiene que ser sostenida en, en el tiempo y creo que quienes hemos trabajado para enfrentar y prevenir la violencia, sabemos que si tenemos altas tasas de violencia, de homicidios, y que éstas se sostienen en el tiempo, necesariamente esta va a um, estar presente en muchos otros estratos, en niveles distintos, y eh, no, no únicamente el, en los homicidios son únicamente la alarma más fuerte que nos habla de otras múltiples formas eh, de violencia. Eh, frente a esto, Tania analiza cómo la violencia afecta el desarrollo humano y habla de un aspecto que me parece que es fundamental y en el que me quiero detener un, un momento, y es el trauma. Y explica cómo una de las mayores <coughs> consecuencias o secuelas de la violencia es el trauma individual y colectivo, pero también el trauma es una de sus más nocivas causas. El trauma es uno de los mayores reproductores, a su vez, de violencia. Y quiero que, que nos quedemos un momento con esta definición, porque de la misma forma en que es una consecuencia y una causa, en la medida en que como individuos, como familias, como comunidades, como sociedad, podrán, podamos sanar el trauma, es una medida en la que vamos a interrumpir o romper la espiral de la violencia. La, pro, la propuesta, eh, como ya mencionaba Eric, nos invita a examinar los factores estructurales que inciden en la violencia. Más que la pobreza, yo diría la exclusión y la desigualdad. Por supuesto, la debilidad institucional. En muchos casos, el crimen organizado ha logrado cooptar partes importantes del Estado. Y en otros casos, eh, la ausencia del Estado también es un, un factor que facilita la aparición de la violencia. Y como ya mencionaba Eric, también existen, Dani rescata factores personales o familiares que inciden en la violencia como violencia de género, violencia contra la niñez, uso de drogas, alcohol, trauma. A estos factores yo agregaría, por supuesto, el acceso a armas de fuego. Es eh, importante coincidir con Tani que no es, la violencia no es un fenómeno ni uni ni monocausal y contribuyen factores tanto, tanto micro como macro. Es un fenómeno, como ella bien describe, sistémico, en el que muchos factores se alimentan y se potencian. Y entenderlo de esta manera como un fenómeno sistémico, sin duda tiene que influir en el momento en el que pensamos políticas efectivas para prevenir y enfrentar la violencia. Es necesario, como ella indica, el enfoque en pasar del enfoque a estrategias aisladas desde un punto de vista institucional, a métodos más holísticos, intersectoriales, interdisciplinarios, intergeneracionales y de naturaleza relacional. Y eh, Tani concluye haciendo hincapié en que las propuestas 
eh, tienen que hacer un énfasis en el desarrollo y el apoyo de esfuerzos locales que desde la ciudadanía fortalezcan las relaciones sociales y reduzcan la violencia. Y quiero hacer dos, dos comentarios finales sobre esta, esta propuesta y sobre un diálogo que sostuvimos desde las ciencias sociales y por supuesto con una jurista, con una exfiscal, y es que uno es una profunda coincidencia en que para entender el fenómeno de la violencia o la violencia crónica debemos de intentar focalizar lo más posible. Para entenderlo tenemos que reducirlo espacialmente al máximo porque no las, los indicadores nacionales o regionales nos dan una vista muy borrosa de qué está ocur eh, eh, ocurriendo y en la medida en que nuestra lupa pueda ir del la región, al país, al departamento, a la provincia, a la ciudad, a la comunidad, al barrio, vamos a poder diseñar respuestas mucho más eh, acertadas. Y creo que este enfoque comunitario, ciudadano, de respuestas que restauren el tejido social, debe sin duda acompañarse con respuestas desde el Estado, que es el principal responsable, de prevenir y enfrentar la violencia y desde el Estado, desde la investigación en la justicia criminal. Creo que esta noción de trauma eh, a, a la que hacía referencia hace un minuto es una de las formas de sanar este trauma individual y socialmente es a través de la reducción de la impunidad y de una respuesta en el marco, por supuesto, del Estado de Derecho a los crímenes. Creo que cuando el sistema de justicia funciona y funciona efectivamente, podemos eh, salir de, de esta zona gris que Tani describe en, en su trabajo, en el cual no se sabe qué es lo correcto y lo incorrecto, y creo que la justicia en nuestras sociedades eh, juega ese papel simbólico tan importante de decir esto es incorrecto, esto no, no debe ocurrir. Termino. Agradeciendo de nuevo al Wilson Center por invitarme a comentar este importante trabajo. Para mí ha sido un gran privilegio, eh, no solo porque considero que es un enorme aporte para enfrentar un problema grave en el hemisferio, sino porque le guardo un cariño y un respeto muy especial a Tani como persona, como profesional y una enorme gratitud por el legado que hizo a mi país para el avance de las ciencias sociales en un momento en el que estaba prácticamente prohibido pensar. Muchas gracias, Erika. Thank you, Claudia. I know you've raised a number of issues that other panelists uh, will want to highlight as well. So thank you for setting the stage for us. Let's turn now to Helen Mack. Uh, adelante. Gracias. Muy buenos días a todos y a todas. <coughs> Antes de comenzar, quiero expresar previamente que conocí el impacto de, del trabajo de Tani como una mujer comprometida con Guatemala, que fue donde nació, creció y también le dedicó lo mejor de su vida. Sabiendo que también fue una, una huella profunda en distintos e escenarios. Entre esas actividades, yo no puedo olvidar que junto con un grupo selecto de personas que conocieron a mi hermana Mirna, con su actitud solidaria, también contribuyó a un antecedente histórico decisivo en mi vida y en la misma sociedad guatemalteca. Por lo que quiero agradecerle a ella este homenaje y también a otras personas cercanas que afectaron realmente mi vida y que lo trascendió. Conocí a Tani en el año 1990 cuando era directora de Greenpeace Latinoamérica en este contexto del asesinato de Mirna. Recuerdo que estuvo a cargo de la creación de las oficinas y campañas en varios países de América Latina, incluyendo México, Brasil, Chile y Argentina, así como la oficina regional en Guatemala para Centroamérica. Se le reconoce, por ejemplo, que luchó por una agenda ambiental desde los países de América Latina fuera aceptada y respetada por la organización internacional. Mi, Mirna, mi hermana Mirna la conoció antes y creo que pudo haberse debido en parte a que pues, las dos eran antropólogas 
y por la amistad de sus maestros antropólogos Joaquín Noval primero y Ricardo Falla después, y por lo que conoció y se acercó también con el papá de Tani, que es el doctor Richard Adams. Supe, por supuesto, de los trabajos posteriores en los que Tani se esforzó por marcar una sensibilidad y responsabilidad social que había marcado su vida profesional. Una de ellas fue su trabajo como directora del Centro de Investigaciones Regionales de Centroamérica, CIRMA, un importante centro de documentación social e histórica ampliamente utilizada por estudiosos locales y extranjeros, en el que se esforzó por ampliar sus actividades de intercambio con la sociedad guatemalteca a través de la investigación. Desde ese espacio, impulsó una actividad importante, que fue la campaña y la exposición desarrollada en los terrenos que ahora es en la antigua estación de ferrocarril de la ciudad, que se le denominó Porque Estamos Como Estamos. Esa actividad realmente fue importante y a mí también me, no puedo negar que también me, me, me impactó, ¿verdad? Porque supo exponer de forma didáctica, especialmente a los jóvenes de escuelas y colegios, esas realidades humanas que no siempre se hacen presentes en la conciencia de los ciudadanos, quizá por la normalización de lo cotidiano en nuestras mentes o quizá por la fuerza de los patrones perversos de una ideología. Así, en esa actividad repasamos todos y posiblemente repasaron muchos jóvenes y niños por primera vez las formas de exclusión social que violentan la dignidad humana y vulnera muchas veces sin que nos percatemos el bienestar de todas las personas que nacimos, crecimos y morimos en Guatemala. Cuando recibí la invitación del Woodrow Wilson Center, me enfrenté con un dilema. El poder responder a las preguntas sobre un tema que, aunque forma parte de mis principales preocupaciones, no tengo sobre él elementos de juicio de un experto. La invitación es clara en cuanto a que solicita una exposición en la que en el presente caso la interrogación se focaliza especialmente en lo que fue el último esfuerzo intelectual de Tan y es el estudio y análisis de la violencia crónica. Hoy en este encuentro nos piden abordar el tema que Tani le dedicó su último esfuerzo intelectual, reconocer, organizar, nutrir y dar el conocimiento en torno a uno de los grandes flagelos de la humanidad, que se manifiesta de forma dramática en nuestro país y en pa países vecinos como en México y el norte de Centroamérica. Evidentemente, me refiero a la violencia, que ella analizó desde la perspectiva de sus trabajos violencia crónica. La solicitud se centra en intentar dar respuestas a preguntas muy es específicas, re recurriendo a las, a las propuestas teóricas de Tani. ¿Cómo la violencia crónica afecta al desarrollo humano? ¿Qué pasa cuando los altos niveles de violencia crónica pasan a ser parte de nuestra normalidad existencial y cómo afecta el desarrollo de los individuos? El esfuerzo para abordar esta pregunta representa para mí un desafío que no estoy segura de poder responder razonablemente porque evidentemente no se trata de repetir lo ya dicho. Así que confesando que no soy experta en el tema, voy a invertir el escenario y me voy a circunscribir a plantear mis dudas y mis angustias por vivir en una de las sociedades más afectadas por el problema en el mundo actual y el tener una visión muy nebulosa que dificulta la búsqueda de caminos de salida real más allá de las utopías y de las esperanzas. Tani define el fenómeno de la violencia crónica y desvela cómo afecta a la humanidad en general, pero identificando las particulares, particularidades que hacen algunas regiones y sectores humanos, especialmente los más vulnerables. En ese sentido, quiero señalar algunos elementos que son centrales en la discusión en la dura realidad. El primero es el relativo a las grandes causas del fenómeno de la violencia. El segundo es la incertidumbre de cómo actuar y cómo superarla. Y el tercero es preguntarnos por qué este conocimiento sustentado, sólida, teórica o empíricamente, no llegan a los tomadores de decisión. Entonces, como punto de partida, tomé un pequeño párrafo del, del trabajo de Tani cuando señala que la violencia crónica es generada a diversos macroniveles y procesos estructurales, lo cual incluye, incluye la extrema pobreza y la creciente percepción de desigualdad social, que son legados históricos del conflicto y violencia, el desplazamiento forzado y la migración. También habla del crimen organizado, la debilidad de las nuevas democracias y el impacto destructivo de políticas de urbanización y ciertas formas de desarrollo económico, etc. Como ya dije, en la Fundación no somos especialistas en los estudios de las distintas clases 
de, de violencia que nos enfrentamos, pero sí hay necesidad de romper y hacer grandes esfuerzos. Eh, yo diría que para porque tenemos eh, esfuerzos internos y externos. Y yo quisiera como enfocar primero esa trayectoria que nosotros tenemos de la, de la violencia del, de, del, del conflicto armado. No puedo dejar de decir, yo sé que he sido reconocida porque me echo siempre mucho la culpa al ejército, ¿verdad? Pero fue muy claro que el, de mucha de la violencia, y quiero aquí, porque quiero hacer ese vínculo de la violencia con la corrupción, en el gobierno de Arana Osorio, que empieza todo un rollo de, de, de grandes eh, genocidios, pues yo, empieza el genocidio, diría yo, ¿verdad? Pero se empieza a incrustar y a desarrollar ya una estructura de corrupción en el marco y en el contexto del conflicto armado, porque eso implica mayor presupuesto cuando se sobredimensiona o se sobredimensionó al enemigo. Habían muchas comunidades que solo habían 200 eh, subversivos y los reportes de inteligencia te decían que eran mil y dos mil. Por eso era la tierra arrasada que se, que se dio. Y una vez preguntándole a un general, le dije, bueno, extranjero porque no era guatemalteco, le dije, ¿pero qué, qué necesidad había de sobredimensionar eh, el tema de los presupuestos y de, de los enemigos? Y él me decía, Helen, tiene que ver con corrupción, porque esto tiene que ver con presupuesto. Es más combustible, más eh, armas y municiones, es más alimentación. Entonces, ahí es donde empieza el, ma el manejo. Pero también otro, otro detalle importante que se dio en, el, en, en, en aquella época, ¿verdad? que todavía uno lo recuerda, de, de Arana Osorio, es que ellos empezaron ya, que el ejército tenía que empezar a ser socios, ya no servidores del sector económico. Entonces, a partir de ahí quiero poner un, un énfasis en, en ese sentido. Y el otro gran vector o determinante de la violencia también tiene que ver con un modelo económico, que hoy pues tiene que ver con el modelo económico globalizante que tenemos. ¿verdad? Entonces, <coughs> Esos macroniveles que ella habla y los procesos estructurales provocan fenómenos de desigualdad, pobreza, migración forzada, que Tani lo expone en su trabajo, pero que también vulneran la esencia y la dignidad humana de, y de, eh, de los oprimidos y también de los opresores, que a veces ni siquiera se dan cuenta que su dignidad humana como opresor como, eh, también es afectada. Entonces, una pregunta, bueno, ya se me terminó los cinco minutos, pero yo lo que eh, quiero resaltar es que también, y ya, yo sé que muchos, eh, pero lo expone Tani, pero hay, hay una parte eh, quizás puedan cuestionar, y esto tiene que ver con que siempre se ha hablado, eh, que, eh, y también las cifras lo dicen en Guatemala, pero que muchas veces en las áreas más pobres no existe tanta violencia, y eso lo podemos ver cuando uno mira el mapa de violencia en Guatemala, Justamente en el occidente, donde hay mayoría de población indígena, no hay tanta violencia. Pero tampoco, por eso es que quise mencionar el tema del, del modelo económico, el tema globalizante y el uso de las redes sociales. Lo que antes podría parecer que las comunidades, y era un amortiguador, eh, no parecían hacer diferencias entre las diferencias de la riqueza de unos y de la pobreza de otros, hoy sí, porque... Eh, Hemos encontrado múltiples eh, testimonios de sicarios que a veces matan por un par de tenis para estar cool, ¿verdad? Y también la desordenada eh, política ¿verdad? de la urbanización, porque cada vez la ruralidad se viene a la parte urbana y tampoco tenemos un ordenamiento territorial que eso pueda contribuir realmente eh, a disminuir toda una violencia. Entonces, no quiero decir que eh, eh, esa es la parte de la complejidad de lo que Tani expone en su, en su trabajo, pero también, eh, hablando, yo me recuerdo con, con, un, con Rodolfo Kepfer, que era un, un psiquiatra también muy cercano al amigo de, de, de mi hermana, él decía que uno no puede estudiar sociedades si tú no entendés tampoco la parte psicológica y emocional de la gente que ahí está. No puedes estudiar sociedades de cómo esa, esa violencia que se convierte en una normalidad 
también va generando toda una violencia, pues como decía Claudia, pues también en esas familias da por esta frustración. Entonces, ¿qué es lo que está sucediendo ahorita? Y ahí es donde yo quiero hacer el link, porque cuando Tani estaba haciendo la, eh, su investigación, sí hablábamos de cómo esta violencia que se normaliza eh, también afecta la ciudadanía. Y afecta a la ciudadanía porque, ¿qué es lo que pasa muchas veces? La gente está viendo cómo sobrevive, tiene que abandonar a sus hijos, estoy hablando ahorita de la urbanidad, muchas veces, ¿verdad?, que dejan encerrados y tiene que ver con las pandillas, que también ha sido parte de la política de Guatemala, y entonces muchas de las veces las pandillas, justo es en las pandillas donde ellos dicen somos homies, porque ahí están sus familias, y eso va creando también pues todo este ambiente eh, de una violencia, o el tema de los migrantes, la gente no migra porque quiere venir a Estados Unidos, migra porque no tiene oportunidades, porque... Y cuando hablábamos con Tani decíamos eso, o sea, ¿cómo va afectando? Por un lado, la necesidad de emigrar porque no tenemos oportunidades por toda la pobreza, la exclusión y, bueno, ya, ya me siguen diciendo, pero a lo que yo quiero ir es que hablábamos en el tema de la, de, la, de, la, de la corrupción, ¿cómo me afecta y cómo te afecta la ciudadanía? Sí empezamos a hablar, hablábamos ya, y de la corrupción que hablábamos anteriormente, de la importancia de la CICIG. Bueno, ya era la CICIAX y la CICIG, eh, de cómo esta corrupción afecta y que se ha ido deteriorando, que quizás en un momento determinado 8 millones de Guatemala un sistema político más o menos te daba. Hoy somos 18 millones y el sistema político no te da para más. Entonces, cuando empezás a tocar, la CICI empieza a tocar estos actores que hemos estado diciendo, empieza toda una narrativa de derechas y de izquierdas que no tiene ningún sentido cuando estamos hablando que dada la corrupción te va afectando las, a las áreas más pobres. ¿Por qué? Porque se queda en el listado de obras geográficas, se queda en los privilegios de los sectores económicos, que ellos dicen, sí, queremos en el libre mercado, pero no hay manera de que se apruebe la ley de competencia. Eh, sí, no creemos en, el, eh, creemos en el libre mercado y que no hay que tener privilegios, son los primeros en tener privilegios. Y cuando se dio el tema de la CICI y le preguntábamos al vicepresidente, yo le decía, ¿cuáles son tus sectores que te, que te eh, desestabilizan? Yo le decía, el sector privado, no, ellos son muy transparentes, ellos te vienen a pedir el Ministerio de Economía, el Ministerio de Finanzas, quieren un puesto porque quieren preservar sus, 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 sus privilegios, pero al mismo tiempo también evaden, evaden impuestos. Entonces, si Guatemala, no solamente tenemos una industria extractiva, que también tiene que ver con la parte de la violencia, pero que le deja el 1% o menos, pero además no, se, no hay presencia del Estado para desarrollar, ahí es donde esa, esa gran población que es la que migra aquí a Guatemala e, y esa corrupción que se da desde el Ejecutivo, desde el, desde el del Congreso, obviamente ese ambiente para desarrollar al ser humano eh, empieza a generar esa violencia en la cual Tani explica. Y cuando hablábamos sobre el tema de la ciudadanía, y hablábamos de AID, porque yo creo que estuve en la última presentación eh, en, que se dio sobre sus, eh, bueno, dan, entregando los, los resultados de su investigación en la fase intermedia, ella me decía que sí, efectivamente estaba hablando con AID para hacer una propuesta precisamente sobre este tema de la violencia crónica y cómo poder porque yo le decía, el, el, tienen que incidir con Guatemala, pero, y creo que también parte del problema de AID, no es problema, ¿verdad?, es que no quieren a veces, muchas veces, trabajar, o todos estos programas para, son, se contratan a las empresas, eh, al Berwey, ¿cómo se llaman las empresas de AID?, pero, y que no trabajan con el gobierno, pero al mismo tiempo necesitas la voluntad política del gobierno y muchas veces pues tampoco hay coordinación. Y eh, se dan errores, perdón que lo diga así, ¿verdad? Se quiere atacar el mismo problema de la violencia, pero cuando definen el tema de la migración y los índices de pobreza, se ponen en comunidades que no necesariamente eh, tiene que ver, o sí tiene que ver, pero no vas a atacar focalizadamente una comunidad que están dispersas por todos lados. Y aquí veo a Úrsula que también hemos discutido con ella, que el tema de migración tiene que verse también con tema de territorio y no con comunidades dispersas para poder atacar un problema, en donde también va vinculado, insisto o insistimos, en el tema del crimen organizado por la falta de ausencia de un Estado. Entonces, 
creo que el, eh, Tani deja un punto de partida de mucho que discutir. No se puede dejar a un lado el tema de la, de la discusión de la corrupción, que también va afectando las democracias, va afectando el desarrollo, que... Eh, y eso, vuelvo a insistir, el desarrollo, la seguridad humana, tanto a nivel social como a nivel, no se puede seguir solamente a base de políticas represivas, ¿verdad? Y el tema de la política migratoria, ya vemos también cómo, bueno, ha sido terrible todo esto de los niños que sucedió actualmente y que vemos un país que por cuestiones de corrupción, porque es un presidente, que como se ve afectada su, <risa> que se va a ir a la cárcel, lo único que le importa es deshacerse de la CICIG. Y no le importa a los niños, que somos más de dos mil niños o seis mil niños aquí eh, separados de sus papás. Fue apoyado por los migrantes y no tiene una política, ni siquiera corresponde a los migrantes que le dieron. Entonces, esa corrupción que está afectando a Guatemala y que hoy por hoy tenemos un desgobierno porque el presidente está más preocupado y utiliza todos los recursos del Estado para deshacerse de una sí con una narrativa que tiene que ver ideológica, que no tiene nada que ver en la lucha contra la corrupción, pero que está calando, y, es, y lo, lo más preocupante es que está calando aquí en, en Estados Unidos, que fue quien uno de los principales, yo vuelvo a decir, cuando estuvimos discutiendo esto, fue en un gobierno republicano, Eric Olson estuvo en esa reunión cuando se discutió con uno de, con Dan Fisk, si te recordás, que justo el tema de la corrupción era parte del problema, y eso no tiene nada que ver con derechas o con izquierdas la corrupción. Entonces, creer en una narrativa de izquierdas y derechas, que Venezuela, que Cuba, que Rusia, nada que ver, son la narrativa de estos poderes que han mantenido oprimido por razones de corrupción al pueblo de Guatemala y que obviamente ustedes están teniendo un problema eh, con razones de seguridad y que a nosotros como, como país centroamericano no podemos desarrollarnos por ese, esa hegemonía que mantienen estos poderes en la corrupción y en la impunidad. Y bueno, para finalizar, agradecer a Wilson Wilson Center <risa> para darnos la oportunidad de estar aquí. Gracias, Gracias Alan. Siempre, <risa> siempre podemos contar con tu gran pasión en estos temas y te lo agradecemos mucho. Uh, we're going to turn next to uh, Gabriela Leva from uh, the Citizen Security uh, Specialist in, in, within the Democracy and Government's Office at USAID in Honduras. Thank you, Gabby, for coming. Thank you, y buenos días. Me van a disculpar, cuando estoy nerviosa, I, I tend to use Spanglish. Um, Spanglish is on Channel 4. <laughs> Um, so I'm part of this team that has been grappling with the issue of violence, and a, a violence quite different from what is known in conflict countries. The Central American and Regional Security Initiative, CARSI, um, started because these levels of violence in the Northern Triangle exploded. It was gang-related violence that neither governments, nor communities, nor families, and quite frankly, even development professionals, practitioners, and academics were struggling to understand where it came from, how it came about, and how it showed up on our doorstep all of a sudden, which really wasn't all of a sudden, but that's how it felt. Um, the governments had tried different approaches, one of them mano dura, the heavy-handed approach, law, throw law enforcement at the problem and see if it works. Um, uh, in my country, the military took a predominant role, and uh, uh, military police was instituted, and that's not helpful. Um, I remember a time when we saw tanks parked on side streets, and we were wondering what were they going to do with the gang violence that wasn't happening necessarily on uh, the main streets, but in the poor urban neighborhoods. Um, donors tried everything as well, and uh, a very traditional development approach, education for education, health for health, and that was not working. And the communities, what they were doing were just merely surviving, normalizing this violence, accepting the gang authority because there was no state presence. Uh, families were shocked. And the policy, trying to understand this from a regional perspective, from a country perspective, from a city perspective, everybody was just dumbfounded. Um, impunity had a heavy uh, impact on all of this. Uh, if you can't put someone away, uh, due process, investigation, and uh, uh, 
a sentence that is commensurate with the crime, then what are you left with? Everybody's, uh, as Helen mentioned, you know, for a cell phone or a pair of tennis <coughs> shoes would do just about anything. And this is when I first met Tani, it was around 2012. <coughs> I was fascinated with her work, her, her passion about how the impact of a chronic violence affects human development, and it just sounded too familiar for comfort. So let me tell you about Honduras. Um, it's a beautiful, mountainous country with wonderful subtropical weather and very warm, welcoming people. It's a bit larger than Tennessee. It has a population of 9 million. 53% are below 24 years old, 53% of our population, and 66% live in poverty. And if you move to the rural areas, one in five live in extreme poverty. That's less than $1.90 a day. In 2010, uh, we had the biggest explosion of violence in our country. The biggest cities were on the top 10 murder capitals of the world. The national homicide rate in 2010 was 77.5 70, per 100,000. In my home state, that was 131.8 per 100,000. Uh, what did that mean for a family? And I think there's nothing better than to talk you, take you through a storyline to try to understand what that meant for families. Um, a single mother, four children, living in a populous neighborhood on the margins of a very industrial city. What they hear on the radio, what they see on the TV, what they walk through or read in uh, newspapers, were about 14 deaths in one day. Gruesome pictures, gruesome TV coverage, people uh, walking next to a bloody sacks with body parts. One single incident on a Sunday night, five people killed in a soccer field, all youth. And this was precisely a, the, the, the visual part of that violence. This single mother had kids that go to a public school. The teachers in that school have no control. They're completely intimidated by the gang presence. There's open gang recruitment in the schools, open drug selling. And to get to school and to get to home, they have to cross invisible borders that only the community knows, where rival gangs are fighting for territory. They're either frisked, their money's taken away, or they're recruited, or they're killed. As this mother goes to work, she has to walk by streets where people are assaulted or being assaulted and has to look the other way, cross over dead bodies, avoid uh, police uh, saturations or um, get on public transportation that could be assaulted by gangs. She has to return home at a certain time because curfews are imposed by the gangs. And when she's tucking her kids into bed, what she hears outside is gunfight. So this is one single day for these families in these neighborhoods. This is what Tani helped us understand. The chronic violence, the trauma, collective and individual, that our families were experiencing in Honduras. It permeated families, it permeated communities, and it permeated cities. The intensity of the violence, the spaces that it invaded, and the dreadful trend that it created. All of this was something that we saw it, but didn't quite understand it. What Tani helped us understand was that youth was an entry, families were detona detonators, her work highlighted the necessity to address the needs inside homes where family originates, pardon, where violence originates. And this was new ground for USAID. We were struggling to understand how do we go into homes. We were used to working in schools. We were used to working in the health centers. We were used to working with specific populations in HIV prevention. But how do you get into homes? She recommended training uh, community-based practitioners, people that were available 24-7, the men, women, the youth uh, from the communities that could help their own communities and were available. She helped our citizen security team identify the macro level drivers and that's a, a very big work but what that meant for us was identifying where the stigma was coming from, where the criminalization of youth was coming from. 
this concept of new poverty, which many of us had a hard time understanding, that the more literate, the more exposed, the more networks, the more social media, the more it creates a need for youth to find an identity. And at that identity in, in struggling families meant sometimes just the gangs. The influence of mass media on the, the Honduran psyche. We didn't recognize how affected we were. We, the development practitioners, sitting very cozy at home, how it affected us, and then trying to understand how it affected families living in the conditions I described for you. <coughs> and how this had a very big influence on migration to, to violence. The internal displacement, but also the external migration. Through Tani's short but very critical desk review and field study in Honduras, our team was able to design integrated approaches that used evidence to change discourse and public policy to this day. And it's not such a gruesome picture anymore. We have achieved quite a bit. In 2017, our national homicide rate is now 43.6 per 100,000. And in my home state, it's 58.4, and I say that with a smile, after 131 in 2010. Uh, we do work a lot with governments, municipal governance overall. We are experiencing, we are um, implementing a place-based approach. Working with the city, with the community, trying to understand the dynamics of that space, rather than understanding it at a country level. So we are working with municipal governance and key civil society actors and the communities themselves to invest the resources in violence prevention to understand the problem, look for solutions <coughs> through a citizen security lens, not an easy feat, but we've been doing it and we've ha been having success. We've been working with communities who are now placed to reject violence, to challenge the use of public spaces that formerly were used for crime are now being used for community needs. And taking back their homes. People who had left their homes because they were threatened by the gangs, ousted by the gangs, are now returning. And that's something that you can see in the communities where we work. We are working with individuals, just as Tani proposi propositioned, the need to work with the individuals, tailoring services to their needs, to their appropriate risk levels, which is also something innovative in our work. F trying to understand where are they, what they need, what level of protection they might uh, require, and what are the risks they're facing. We have embedded uh, family counselors to address the individual trauma. We have family promoters working with communities. We have mentors working with youth. And we have a, a network of beautiful volunteers who are there to help both families, individuals, youth, seniors in these communities to walk through their day without the violence. We have families making huge strides to strengthen their communication, the support, and the, t the identity so that those youth don't go to the gangs. Um, and we have helped the state regain its presence. Enhance the trust that the communities have in the state is not easy, not in countries where corruption is a huge issue. Uh, but working through this place-based approach with the municipal governments, we have tried to bridge that lack of trust and make them partners. And what we've seen is that communities that are most afflicted by violence, the data tells us they're getting better. And this is also part of the learning process, how to go from regional indicators, regional observatories, to national level observatories, to local observatories to, that tell us, down to the community, down to the street, where the violence is occurring. We are working with the education sector to help them better become better equipped to mitigate the violence in the schools, around the schools, and with the communities, rather than just react. We are working with the private sector to break down the barriers of stigma and social exclusion. And this is specifically directed at youth. And it's a huge issue. If you are youth from the Lopez Arellano community in Choloma, you are not given a job. So how do we break that? And that's not easy. The private sector is legitimately scared, legitimately worried of how to protect their interests. But working with them and helping them understand that these, these youth, that these communities are fighting the same thing they are, has helped to break down those barriers. We are also working directly with the national police 
and, the and helping them and the communities become allies. That's not easy in a country that has been riddled with uh, scandals around police. A recent purge of the police has helped to uh, increase the perception, positive perception of the police. And more importantly, the communities that are working with the new police have become friends, have become sounding boards, have become allies, and also, you know, someone to cry, have an extra shoulder to cry on, police and communities. They are also afflicted by the same violence that the communities are afflicted by. And understanding that both of them are working for the same team has made a huge difference. I know it sounds really, really simple, but getting to that point where communities actually want the police on their community committees has been the turning point. Uh, this we are calling success. We are working with the justice se sector to enhance access to justice in the communities that are most afflicted by violence. And breaking down those structural barriers that entrench impunity. We're also working with the juvenile justice actors, specifically the ju justice sector, changing policy to insert risk differentiation when dealing with youth in conflict with the law. What this means is instead of locking them up, giving them a second chance making sure that they're not going into a detention facility that will actually recruit them for gangs, but helping them go back to their communities, go back to their homes, and build the identity that they're seeking. We frankly continue to seek ways to address collective trauma. That's not always easy. But this is Tani's legacy to Honduras. This legacy has embed been embedded into the policy dialogue, into a change in discourse, a change in perception. I am quite frankly happy when I see surprised faces in government when we tell them that 77% of the communities that they consider gang-ridden are at a primary <coughs> level risk. And they wonder why. And I say, well, good job. Um, this uh, success, this that I have described to you is something in the making. It's not something set in stone. We're working every single day to build sustainability throughout these processes, but to see the improvement in the, uh, in the Honduran lives, in the family lives where we work, is something that keeps us motivated. I, Tani was my mentor. Um, I had very long conversations with Tani about the work and the struggles in Honduras. She was my sounding board. Sometimes my fellow colleagues think I'm crazy. Uh, I wasn't daunted. And working through some of the ideas with Tani helped me understand how to better articulate how to get from the theory to the practice. She was my creative inspiration, this understanding of new poverty, collective trauma. I had a hard time going through that, and um, she helped me understand it and put it into context and find ways to address it. I say I, but this is a very big team of devoted colleagues. Uh, and sometimes they just let me ramble on and on like I'm doing now. And when we together come to this uh, idea of how to make it come together in a development program. And she was a dear friend. So I'm very honored to be here talking about how she influenced USA Honduras. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Gabby. And I, I know, I'm sure there are many USAID folks online watching us now, and some probably in the room, so we're, we're grateful for, for your work. Let's turn now to uh, Juanita Roca from the Inter-American Foundation, who's partnered in this organization and also done a lot to support and integrate Tani's work. Thank you, Eric. Well, it's a real pleasure um, to be here to honor Tani and to be among friends. Um, this is an emotional moment. Uh, I think we all felt very strongly how she impacted in, in our lives. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Inter-American Foundation and how we've incorporated some of her thinking. As Paloma mentioned, um, around 2012, um, Tani came to give a presentation at the IF, and I must say that it was a real aha moment for us. Uh, foundation representatives like myself had been seen through our work and through our grant making, through our monitoring of our active grants in the region that violence in many forms uh, was, a, uh, um, uh, was affecting successful implementation of, of the projects. 
But it, there were also concerns for ourselves, for our in-country teams, <coughs> and for the grantee partners. We sensed there was something else going on. For me, as one of the foundation rep representatives that was present at the time, I had the privilege to be there, there were two aspects of her framework that really struck a chord. First, the affirmation that living with chronic violence affects the way people relate to each other. As social relations are affected, the way that we, we direct um, the relation to the capacity of individuals and community to carry out collective action. Ultimately, this is the essence of our work at the IF. Second, the statement that we have to acknowledge that we are living a new normal was very powerful, and it challenged us to think our support to grassroots organizations in a different way. The premise of the foundation's development work relies on the role that organized civil society, especially local organizations, has in addressing their priority needs. But what happens when these organizations' capacity for working together is threatened, ultimately threatened, by chronic violence? So we set out to ask our grantee partners, what did they think about this framework? Were, did they feel that it was as important as it had been for us here in DC? So we set out to ground truth um, our exploration of chronic violence with our grantee partners. And this was, this was an essential, essential step for us to make sure that it could be useful to us and to the partners in the region. With Tani and Philip, we developed a three-day interactive and participatory methodology to engage with a group of grantee partners in five countries in Latin America. They represented organizations, indigenous organizations, women and Afro-descent organizations, organizations working with youth, representing both urban and rural communities. Our intention was to learn by doing and do by learning. Unfortunately, this was the moment that Tani began to get sick, so she was unable to accompany us to the field. So some of the highlights, some of the components that um, I want to share with you, some of the components that most resonated with our grantee partners. The whole notion of new poverty that I think was mentioned, you know, high rates of urbanization, literacy, combined with job informality, the perceived gap between aspirations and livelihood <coughs> options, relative deprivation. This was something uh, most of the participants in our, in our workshops were coming from very poor and marginalized communities, and they were particularly surprised to imagine that 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 they were feeling could also be felt by middle-income people in their countries. The notion of perverse normality that increased tolerance and acceptance of violence and illegality was another one that really, really resonated. That violence begets violence. Um, this was particularly clear for the women who immediately linked it to domestic violence. That violence can be transmitted intergenerationally was very, very powerful. Um, there were a lot of participants that had families, but they also felt that this was the area, which was very interesting, where they could influence the most. And finally, social death, that idea of youth, you know, youth is a very big concern for a lot of our grantee partners in the region. So this notion of social moratorium, the incapacity for youth to do a healthy transition into adulthood was another thing that really spoke. But there were some other components of the framework that were a lot harder to grapple with. Um, I must say that for all of us, it's much easier to describe how we are victimized, but it's definitely harder to recognize how we perpetuate it. So the idea, one of <coughs> the components of blaming others for violence, the scapegoating, xenophobia, self-victimizations, participants understood the concepts, but were actually unable to sort of move into understanding how they were perpetrators. The second one was ex exclusionary practices, social, religious, ethnic. The self-reflection was very difficult, especially for those participants that were coming from organizations that promote inclusion of historically marginalized communities. We had a case of an Afro-descent organization that was explicitly stating in the workshop they didn't want indigenous people to be part of their organization, and yet there was that disconnect. So what did all of this mean to us at the IEF? We affirm that strong community organizations appear to reduce violence, or at least keep it at bay. 
we confirm the importance of generating safe spaces for reflection and discussion. The prevention and reduction of violence requires, as others have said, a systemic, integral, and nuanced approach, moving away from siloed perspective to a more ho holistic approach. And finally, the framework shifts the major long-term objective to reduce or eliminate specific kinds of quantifiable <coughs> violence towards a goal of enabling groups vulnerable to the forms of violence to be able to thrive, to have the tools to be able to. So how has this influenced our work since engaging with Tani? We learned to ask when we first meet our grantees in the field visits, many times we, we the first time anybody has asked them about violence, we explicitly address this issue. And many times it's the first time that they've had a chance to speak about it collectively. How does violence affect you? And they've, there's always some very interesting um, answers to this with very concrete suggestions for the implementation of the ideas of the projects that they're proposing. So for example, if a grant involves young people, thinking of what you just said, Gabriela, um, that neither work or study, the ninis, a small stipend to get them to school safely by taking a bus and moving between gang territories can make all the difference. Or in some cases, grantees asking for more local markets for their products instead of having to go outside of certain parameters and this way sort of reducing their risk for extortion. We have taken the need to open safe spaces for reflection and support <coughs> also very seriously. A few years ago in Colombia, as we thought about peace building, we funded 18 different projects as a cohort, which included funds for exchanges and for participation at key events promoted by the grantees. Both these opportunities open spaces for grantees to gain trust in one another, build bridges, and begin to share the strategies that they use for the prevention of violence and peace building, ultimately leading towards them recognizing resources between them and among them. So one example is in the northern coast of Colombia that has experienced extreme situations of violence in the past, identified personal healing as a first and necessary step towards reconciliation is one of the strategies. They shared the strategy of what they called the Sancocho Sanador, where participants each bring an ingredient <coughs> to cook, a traditional cook, a traditional soup from the region, and as they do, they begin to speak about their experiences many times for the first time in a safe space. Finally, we've expanded our lens with which we monitor specific grant activities, taking advantage of our visits to make more explicit the efforts the community and their local organizations carry out that helps demonstrate their resilience. As an outsiders, we are in a privileged position to look beyond what is happening in each one of the grants. So for example, in Colombia, we worked closely with a partner who documented, who has documented for at least two decades peace building efforts in the country. We asked them to facilitate a few grantee meetings, different spaces with participants from this cohort and place themselves in a historical timeline and explicitly begin to show that in that historical and compared to all of the, of the group that they already had been analyzing for two decades, they actually have a lot of strategi strategies that make them resilient. As we move forward, we will miss Tani's wisdom and keen eye in helping us mainstream chronic violence as a development challenge that if addressed in a systemic, integral, and nuanced approach, as she proposed, will contribute towards giving communities the necessary tools to thrive. We're grateful for Tani's contribution. Thank you. Thanks so much, Juanita. Um, we're gonna hear lastly from Philip Thomas, um, and please, we'll have, we should have a good 20 minutes for questions with the audience, dialogue with the audience, so, so be prepared for that. So Philip, finish this panel. Now, <laughs> I'll try to be brief so we do have time for some questions and comments. Um, and so much has already been said. 
it, it is an honor for me. I was unable to make any memorial services. I was in, in Somalia when I got a call from Tani. We worked together for the last 15 years, but in the last six to seven years, really intensely on this, and probably talked every day or at least three to four times a day. And I got the call from Somalia. She says, Philip, I, I don't think things are going really well. And so I said I'd come home, and I flew right home. And then when I got up the next morning to, to come out here, it's when I got a call from or an email from Gina saying she had passed away. So I really regretted missing spending the last couple of days with her. Those eyes say everything in the photo. I really like that photo because it expresses the intensity of her spirit, the intensity of her compassion, uh, and the sense of urgency that she felt and brought to her work. Uh, Tani, Tani was uh, uh, just a powerful person to work with, which sometimes meant a very difficult person to work with. Um, those, those of us who have worked with her know that. Um, she'd be very accelerated. I would often liken her to a semi in the passing lane, saying, yeah, Tani, just calm down. Um, but she did calm down. She did calm down the last several years and become much more contemplative. And I think that's why she was having some really breakthrough thinkings in, in the work she was doing. And, and it was a real honor. We, we laughed together. We cried together. We fought together. And so it's an honor to be here to celebrate maybe less assess and more celebrate the work that she started. Now it's on us to carry it forward, and hopefully we'll develop mechanisms to assess what's moving, what's moving forward with the implications. Um, many conversations with Tani that focused around when she came, moved back to the States. I was living in Guatemala for a while, too, and for the last six or seven years, more involved in Africa and in the Middle East. But when we would talk, we would just kind of reflect back on Latin America and wonder, after so much investment, after so much work and hard initiatives, why is it so hard to find any of the needles that we wished were moving to move? It just seemed the sense that maybe we're stuck. And I remember Tani always grappling with uh, and coming to this point in her own mind saying, well, maybe what most needs to change is our thinking. Maybe we need to stop. Maybe we need to stop acting, stop investing, and just take a pause and consider, what if we were to understand and define the problems we've been tackling differently? How might that influence our actions? Um, and I really appreciated the curiosity with which she started raising some really critical questions. We would have conversations. I would join her on the phone. I would join her on some of the trips. And, and she would be smiling hearing what you both shared and how things have moved forward. But we always left conversations with a sense of uh, talking about violence. People would kind of get right away what she says because it doesn't sound like rocket science but they would get it because it would fall in the old paradigm that they already had, and they made sense of it very differently than I think Tani was trying to convey. And, and we always lament this idea of how to talk about violence in a way that gets people who work on violence to step out of their perspective and really go to the balcony and say, what are the real implications of what's being said here? On the surface, it sounds easy, but on, at depth, there's, there really are some significant things that if we stop and take pause, carry significant implications in terms of shifts that Tani was calling for. In fact, we often debated, is this about violence or is this about development? Because we'd find ourselves talking with a lot of people. We'd go into the countries and we'd meet with people who are kind of the obvious actors that you would bring into a room if your topic is violence and security. And then we'd leave and we'd say, but, but isn't this work more about, well, it's that, but what about the health? What about education? What about all these other aspects that are embedded in the framework that she's saying? Why don't we have them there? And so each, each person kind of dedicates to their own area of specialty. So if it's security, you frame the problem as a security issue and you find the solutions to that. If it's a health problem, and Tani lays that out, we find the health solutions. If it's an education, and I think what Tani was really, really wanting to see, and, and I'm just going to jump to the end of where, what I think her aspirations are, where they would lie now, is, is something that we brainstormed a lot about. I was kind of her she would call me her process person or her dialogue person because that's my field of how to get people together. So it kind of ground her in terms of how to take lofty ideas and actually run with them. But what would it look like to actually, at a, in a place-based way, like you were saying, um, the importance of being very local, what would it look like to bring government actors, civil society actors, local actors together and, and first take time to understand how are we framing and naming our experience? What really are the problems we're dealing? Because right now, it's a shift from this kind of siloed approach, as you've said, or the sectoral or the disciplinary, or even a multidisciplinary where you make sure you get the health perspective of education. But what does an interdisciplinary perspective look like where 
we're actually trying to see the nexus between our, between our different silos, between our different disciplines. And, and let's go to the very local level. So we brainstorm in, in some of the countries, and this is what we're trying to do in Honduras, where we say, let's get all these actors together and kind of force them to step out of their perspective and just go back. And what would it look like if we could map the complexity of what we're trying to do? And I often like it to the study of spider webs, that in order to study a spider web, what you do is you throw baking powder on the web, and that's what makes the web visible. And when it becomes visible, then you can kind of see the interdependencies and the connections. And I think much of the work that Tani was doing was casting the powder onto the web and allowing us, one, to see the phenomena, the complexity of the phenomena that we're trying to address, and, and then to step back and actually see the complexity of our own thinking, uh, making visible the assumptions we held that once they're, once they're named, maybe we can say, maybe those assumptions no longer hold as true as they did in the past, so how might we act differently? I think Tani calls us to make significant shifts that have already been mentioned um, that are obvious when we say them. This is the problem of language. When you hear it, you just kind of say, yep, that makes sense. But it's only when you sit with it and ponder it that you and, and it kind of exploit its implications that it really becomes powerful. And it's, it's one, um, this idea of the new normal, which we all buy into, but then that means we have to have new ways of thinking to kind of rise to the occasion of what the new normal is this shift from this kind of narrow focus of violence to uh, a, a broader focus of human development. And, and, and rather than the question of being how to eliminate or reduce violence, what does it mean to create conditions for thriving individuals? For individuals to thrive as a person, as a social being, and I really like the way Tani also said, as a civic being, what does citizenship look like? Tani's framework is also challenging the idea of looking at the vulnerable groups and really framing and staying within the narrative of victim and rights discourse, saying, well, all of that makes perfect <coughs> sense. It's not discarding that. What would it look like if we started embracing a responsibility discourse that recognized in many contexts the state will not have the capacity to respond as it, we would want? What would it look like if we carried to these vulnerable groups the sense that you are agents of change? You do have responsibilities and opportunities. I remember when we went to Honduras, we were told, first of all, you can't get into those communities. Police, the fire, don't go there. We got permission to go there, and they said, well, if, even if you go there, they're not going to talk to you. Certainly not you, a gringo. Um, and, and they did. They did. When, when you ask the right question, create the safe space, people open up and they frame and they articulated beautifully how they were living their experience <coughs> in a way that also, I think, informed and gave clues on how to act moving forward. The other thing of Tani, again, that we, we uh, this t taking, moving beyond a linear focus, looking for what's the root cause of violence and security, uh, to understanding into the systems uh, phenomena, which means root cause thinking is kind of outdated. We use the tree to kind of look at the roots, the trunk, and then the symptoms, and we want to address the roots and not the symptoms, so we're strategic. But what feeds the roots is the foliage of the leaves that falls to the ground. And so Tani, again, is casting that powder on the web to allow us to see when we can map the complexity of the realities we're trying to deal with, what that offers is multiple entry points for action. It allows me to see where what I'm doing connects with what you're doing and what you're doing, and then we can hope for synergy. The idea, which I think was proven false in the work on reflecting on peace practices, uh, was this myth that say, look, we can't all do it, be experts in everything. We can't be experts in health and education and security. And um, So my field is this, I'll be good, you just be good in your own field. And somehow it'll all add up. What we're seeing 20 years later is that's a myth. Things don't add up unless we have the capacity to at least connect the dots. It doesn't mean we all start doing everything, but it does mean we develop the capacity to interconnect and see how our work does connect with each other. Um, the the uh, complicated and complex uh, was another important frame. One last shift I'll talk about is, is, is taking the problem of violence and, 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 and no longer framing it as this is a complicated problem. We just need to continue doing what we're doing, but we need to do it better. We're doing the right things, but we're just not doing them well. And shifting the focus from do things better to or, that we are doing the right things, but to doing are we doing the right things rather than doing things right. And complicated is going out and looking for best practices. And Tani did this well. She went in trauma. All the different fields she writes about, she went out and really mined some of the most innovative practices. But she knew that the idea of best practices and incorporating the context was weak. We need to first understand each situation uniquely 
And there's so many variables you don't control that this isn't about finding the solution and rolling it out. It's about creating experimental labs. So moving forward, I think Tani's aspiration would be to move forward some of the ideas she and I talked a lot about, she began to write about, but unfortunately didn't get incorporated. And that was creating these change, this idea of change labs, these idea of, 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 of experimental places where donors, policymakers, practitioners had just a little bit more patience at deciding on what strategy to employ and first spent time saying, how can we mindfully create an opportunity to, to, to act, reflect, learn, and maybe over two or three years, we'll have some learnings and say, at least in the Northern Triangle in some of these contexts, this is what we learned. Now, these are the new strategies that are all at the level of policy and practice. But first, and Tani was adamant about that, first, we don't know. She would say, I don't know what this means. We need to go out and learn. We need to become curious and create these labs to learn. The final thing was uh, her beginning to uptake, uh, take up what uh, collective impact, a really important area of work that's uh, experienced in other contexts that I think is, is really relevant for moving this work forward. And that is, what does it actually look like when you bring sectors uh, at, from all levels, from top, down, bottom, up, and across sectors together to address a systemic phenomena? One of the learnings from collective impact is saying, can we at least come together and identify, one, what are the needles we want to move? And that has to be informed from an integral perspective. And two, can we at least agree, each of us, to gather data that c goes into a common monitoring so we have shared indicators? It may be that I'm not working on the area that's your focus, but the indicators that will prove that you're having success are entirely relevant to what I do. So the idea of collective impact is at least let's have collaboration around identifying what are the relevant indicators, how can we collect the necessary data, and have a share. So over the next three or four years, all sectors from their own perspectives can monitor and have this dashboard saying, where are we at moving the needle forward? Thank you, Tani. Uh, you have started conversations that will continue to be very strategic, and I look forward to seeing how these move forward. And it's a delight, really delight, to be with the panel with you all. Thank you. All right, thank you all. You've been very patient. Thank you for all your presentations. I've jotted down a lot of notes and would love to ask all the questions myself, but <laughs> I will give you all an opportunity. Uh, we have interns with uh, microphones that you can use. Please raise your hand. I'll take three, three questions. And while we do that, we have one over here, uh, Sam. I also wanted to point out that Jessica Tuller, I think we, meant, we failed to mention her, an intern, was very instrumental in putting together the materials for this event as well. Thank you, Jessica. So a question here. Uh, Christina, could you identify yourself, okay. even though you're well known? Uh, okay, my name is Christina Spinel, but today I'm here. Okay, let me talk in, in Spanish. Ah. Pero hoy estoy, eh, hoy estoy aquí, no como Colombia Human Rights Committee. Estoy como terapista de niños que llevo más de 30 años trabajando con niños que vienen del conflicto de muchas partes del mundo, eh, específicamente en trauma. Y mi pregunta es para las dos compañeras guatemaltecas, Helen uh, y Claudia. Eh, escuché que en Honduras hay un programa para trabajar en el aspecto psicosocial y quiero saber en Guatemala cómo está desarrollando el aspecto psicosocial no solamente con madres y adultos, sino también con niños, porque sabemos que el trauma se, se transmite a generaciones y también porque el trauma afecta el desarrollo del cerebro. Entonces, me interesaría saber eh, cómo se está desarrollando este trabajo psicosocial en Guatemala, especialmente con los niños. Gracias. Question over here. Hi. My name is Bo Carlson. I'm with the Latin America Working Group. Um, I had a question for Gabriela. I wonder if some of your partners, um, like the counselors, the mentors that you have in Honduras, have encountered any violence for trying to dissuade community members from joining gangs? And how does USAID um, balance trying to decrease violence while also protecting your community partners? Great, Sam, Cindy has a question up here. Thanks, uh, Cindy Arnson with the Latin American Program. Um, I was really inspired to hear both from Gabriel and Juanita and to a lesser extent from all of you, Philip as well, um, how the theoretical work 
um, and the look for things you could do in the world have actually had an impact on how organizations like USAID or the Inter-American Foundation conduct themselves when they're, when they're in the region. And the question I have is um, what would be sort of next steps in making these um, approaches more mainstream, more widespread, more um, <coughs> adopted by this huge array of institutions, of development banks, um, of governments that are trying to find solutions to all of the things I think that Claudia pointed out in her opening words, you know, the statistics about the percent of the population that Latin America has versus the percent of the homicides and the number of most violent cities in the world and that kind of thing. What do you see as uh, sort of the transmission mechanisms to make this kind of a much broader, uh, to, to, to cause a much broader embrace of, of this kind of thinking and, and practices? Great. We'll uh, take uh, a few minutes to hear from panelists on these three, and then we'll try to get in another round. Uh, who wants to uh, start? All right, if you don't volunteer, I'm going to volunteer you. <laughs> so why don't we start with Gabriela okay. and uh, hear from Juanita, and then anyone else. I'd be delighted to hear from Philip on this. Question for the Guatemalans, too, so please, everybody. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> the family counselors, counselors, mentors, volunteers that we uh, use in our programming are from the communities. So that is a protection factor for them in and of itself. Uh, they are people that are moral leaders. They are people that have been doing this, whether they're from a church or they're just uh, good-natured, generous people who give advice uh, out of the goodness of their heart. We've just given them the tools the training, the resources, to be able to provide the services where they live. And that in itself is not a threat to the organized groups living in that space. Uh, the same goes for our implementing partners. Working to decrease violence is really, really tough. Um, you have to, what we've embraced is working at it from every perspective, every node, a systems thinking kind of way, every node that we can get into. And we have come to the understanding that doing this in partnerships and alliances within groups decreases or mitigates the violence that could be directed at one group or one individual. Um, it's not rocket science, but it's, it's working. Uh, communities, community boards, parent boards, uh, municipal councils, we've had uh, incidents where people have been <coughs> killed for being outspoken. Uh, there is one single incident that comes immediately to mind when one person at the start of all of this dared to say that the problem in their community was that there was no police. That mother was immediately shot in the meeting. Uh, that was, I would say, 10 years ago. Today, we openly talk about the violence affecting the communities. We talk about it from a community perspective. It's our children. And quite surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, gang members have grown up. They're no longer the 14 or 16-year-old thugs. They have children. They have families. Their mothers live in these communities. So they also want the protective <coughs> factors that we're trying to embed for the rest of the community for their own families. So we are not a challenge. Violence prevention is not a challenge. That challenge comes from law enforcement. And although we help it, we, uh, from the USAID mission in Honduras, we support the national police. We're supporting the community police aspect of it to allow the, the first, the police to get into the communities, build the trust, and build the intelligence they need, but build the rapport with the communities. And I think that protects the communities, protects the local actors, protects the NGOs, protects the donors. Um, more than anything we could do, uh, I remember the first time that we went into the communities and I was thinking back when Philip said uh, that he got told that they couldn't go in. We went in armored vehicles, escorted by police. That was my first trip into a community. Big mistake. Um, we learned in, in one day how not to do it. 
Um, nobody wanted to talk to us. Nobody wanted to be associated with us. And that's the learning process. And I think uh, we've come a long way. And we've tried to share, going to the next question, how do we mainstream approaches and uh, how do we share our homegrown knowledge and transition mechanism? I think the best thing is to demonstrate and model success. We've tried very small pilots and have grown to medium-sized pilots, and we're calling the next one El Piloton. <laughs> um, we, we've tried to go from very small to medium to slightly larger and trying to help others see how it works. And we've run into lots of barriers and lots of failures, but we try to take one step back and demonstrate how to move forward. And that we demonstrate it to other partners. The place-based approach is really difficult because there's no attribution. Everybody's in the same place. Not one project, not one government, not one uh, NGO, not one USAID can say that that success is ours or direct. If there's a straight line to, the sex, to that success, um, we can say that we have a collective impact, a collective success, and we're good with that. Because what we see is a reduction in homicides, mm -hmm. a reduction in extortion, and thriving families, thriving communities. And I think that's the best way to transition learning to other donors. We also share all our data. The boring reports that nobody wants to read uh, are all public access. But we share it uh, when we take our community walks. Um, an anecdote. Three weeks ago, I was standing in the murder spot of my hometown, Bonitillo. It used to be the police didn't want to go in there. And one of our fun indicators, we can certainly share that one, is does is pizza delivered in this place? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. You know, everybody can share that. Mm -hmm. We had pizza deliveries, cable companies, tourism destinations. And I was standing at 9 p.m. in the soccer field that used to be the scenario for mass shootings at 9 p.m. watching Frozen with a bunch of kids. <laughs> that's the change that we see, and that's the change that we hope to inspire others to model, to try out, and to share. Pizza delivery is an indicator of success, right? There are other ones, too. I think it's very creative. Juanita, do you want to jump in? I just wanted in? to just sort of follow up on the mainstreaming on Cynthia's uh, question. I think Philip obviously alluded to it, I think, in the best way, the whole idea of doing experimental labs and change labs. You know, we at the Inter-American Foundation, we work very much at the local level. So ultimately, you know, that will continue to be our focus. We will continue to do a bit of this experimenting with our partners. But another way that we also um, think permanently on mainstreaming is we don't do any action without partnerships. We work with others, not only organized civil society, but you know it can be through our partner grantees. There's usually there can be local government, there can be regional, departmental, um, you know, government, and also private sector and other and other players. So I think creating, as, as Philip was, was saying, creating shared indicators and making it much more explicit, that will eventually lead to being able to share and have some of this, these indicators as the pizza <laughs> delivery that prove that these types of strategies are really successful. Thank you. Helen or Claudia, querían aportar algo? Sí, quizás um, un, un elemento muy importante eh, siguiendo la, tu pregunta de cómo podemos encontrar estas prácticas exitosas y sobre todo cómo compartirlas. Y creo que es un, un paso muy importante a nivel hemisférico que hemos estado eh, trabajando con los 34 países que conforman la OEA para eh, construir un plan hemisférico de prevención y reducción de homicidios. Y una parte muy importante de este plan por cierto, que integra tanto políticas de prevención como políticas eh, de enfrentamiento, como políticas de protección a grupos eh, vulnerables, intentando recoger esta visión holística en la elaboración de políticas públicas. Pero uno de los elementos muy importantes es que se está construyendo una plataforma para la prevención y reducción de homicidios, donde esperamos reunir todas estas 
eh, prácticas o políticas exitosas para que otros estados las puedan tomar, aprender y poner en funcionamiento adaptándolas en lo que sea necesario. Eh, esperamos muy pronto eh, que este plan eh, sea, sea aprobado. Respecto a la pregunta del trauma, eh, puedo compartir eh, mi experiencia en Guatemala desde la Fiscalía. Sí se ha avanzado en un esfuerzo de incorporar la atención psicológica en el momento que una víctima accede a la Fiscalía o a la Justicia. Hay todo un tema de diálogo entre disciplinas muy importante que hay que fortalecer. Y también lo que trabajamos fuertemente en Guatemala fue crear eh, redes de derivación con el Ministerio de Salud o con otras organizaciones locales que trabajan eh, salud y el, el aspecto psicosocial de la salud para que el Ministerio Público no creciera y creciera tomando otras funciones que no, que no le son propias. Es decir, crear... Eh, fortalezas para la atención inmediata, pero también toda una red social y comunitaria que a quien, con quienes pudiéramos trabajar. Eli. Gracias. Bueno, para seguir con el tema de la, de la atención psicosocial, los acuerdos de paz en Guatemala establecían incluso la importancia de un programa de salud pública, de salud mental pública, pero como hay mucho estigma también al tema de la salud mental pública, eh, fue desechado, dijéramos, por el próximo gobierno que era contrario a los acuerdos de paz. Y aquí eh, la base de partida, y por eso digo, nos, la fundación, no, yo no soy experta en las distintas clases de violencia, pero esa frustración social que uno puede tener por distintas razones, incluso se puede observar, porque eso sí fue parte de la discusión, por ejemplo, con Tani, eh, en, bueno, en Guatemala, ¿verdad? Por ejemplo, cómo los buses manejan y cómo se te tiran, ahí hay una clase de violencia, ¿verdad?, que no son violencias visibles o con no, por eso el tema de la normalización, ¿verdad?, eh, que son violencias inherentes pero que no son visibles y de esa cuenta debemos, eh, por ejemplo, cómo a veces porque un carro no camina, sacan la pistola y te matan, que creo que eso lo viste en Colombia. Yo recientemente vine, estuve participando en un evento en la zona del Catatumbo de Colombia y hablando precisamente sobre los temas de la violencia, a veces hay... Bueno, a veces los problemas se saben, pero no se hablan eh, o se hablan muy light por lo que eso implica. Pero lo que me, 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 digamos, me impactó fue que un muchacho se me acercó y me dijo, mire doctora, eh, nosotros estamos claros, ¿verdad? pero es que ahorita la discusión es qué clase de violencia queremos escoger. Como quien dice, sabemos que está la violencia, dijéramos que te implican las guerrillas sobre el tema de, de las siembras de drogas, pero saben que inmediatamente viene, por eso hablaba yo del modelo económico, el tema extractivo de los recursos naturales. Y junto con ello, de las compañías, vienen sus empresas privadas de seguridad. Entonces viene otra clase de violencia. Entonces, ¿cuál es, ¿cómo vamos a escoger entre qué clase de violencia queremos? Y esto estoy hablando de la zona del Catatumbo que te tiene con la frontera en Venezuela, ¿verdad? Y ahí hay, como en Guatemala, ¿verdad? Con la, nuestra frontera con México, todo el tema de crimen organizado, el tema de, bueno, tráfico de personas, contrabando de, de productos en, allá en el Colombia, es todo el tema de, también de combustible, etcétera. Entonces, y eso lo experimentamos en Guatemala, ¿verdad? Teníamos la violencia, pero ahora, ¿qué clase de violencia queremos? Y aquí es por, por lo que Tani también... Eh, lo explica, ¿verdad? Es eh, eh, verlo de una manera mucho más integral, mucho más holística y en la última parte eh, dijéramos cómo eso también te afecta en tu ciudadanía que tiene que ver con el tema de corrupción porque Guatemala no es un país como Colombia o México que tiene petróleo en donde eh, esto pueda dijéramos, tienen recursos propios para poder invertir en eh, hacer una inversión social. En Guatemala tenés, no tenés otra más que ir regulando precisamente los privilegios que tienen ciertos grupos eh, poderosos, hacer que paguen impuestos para poder lograr un desarrollo. Pero si eso se queda replicando el sistema, que yo venía diciendo porque están como muy claras, ¿verdad? Toda la época de Arana Osorio, en la época del FRG, que ya venía la mutación de estas redes... Y luego ahorita con, con, con este gobierno, pues que está, es un partido de gobierno que está, fue fundado por los mismos militares de antes, 
o sea, los mismos violadores de derechos humanos. Entonces, viene toda esa replicación de esa violencia y uno ya entiende, por ejemplo, la declaración que dio el presidente, hablando de la normalización de la violencia, eh, con, en un medio de comunicación aquí, donde dice que la, la corrupción es algo normal y cultural. Entonces, esto estoy hablando de la... De la hablando en, refiriéndose a la corrupción que cometió su hermano y su hijo, pero esa corrupción es la que te lleva también a, a esa marginación y exclusión de muchos sectores, y no digamos en el caso de Guatemala con el tema de las municipalidades, que tiene que ver con el tema de la urbanización y los servicios básicos que tiene que prestarle a una población que también viene migrando excluida, dijéramos, de, de, del interior y que vienen al territorio sin ninguna eh, política pública sobre urbanización. Entonces, ahí se va incrementando, que son lo que viene siendo todo un foco. Yo sé que hay mucha discusión sobre el tema de que no siempre la pobreza es igual a la violencia y, y uno puede entrar a, a, a esas discusiones, pero sí cuando tú tienes esa exclusión, esa marginación, esa muerte social a la que le habla Tania hacia esos sectores sociales, pues te va generando esta, esta violencia, primero interna, por eso hablaba de, de, del tema de las emociones, ¿verdad?, psicológica y emocional, y para poder hacer y concluir con la pregunta que, 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 que Cindy estaba preguntando, Claro, nosotros ahorita en Guatemala estamos enfocados en el tema de corrupción, porque vuelvo a insistir, si tú no, no empezás, que la, el tema de la corrupción no es una cuestión ideológica, ¿verdad? Lo, esa narrativa la ponen quienes se han ocupado, eh, de, que han vivido de la corrupción, y que la narrativa ideológica de, eh, de que quienes estamos en la lucha contra la corrupción somos los de Venezuela, somos los comunistas, somos... Es ya también de la época del pasado. Esto tiene que ver con el desarrollo del ser humano para poder evitar lo que para, en términos de Estados Unidos lo han declarado una seguridad nacional para ellos, que tiene que ver con crimen organizado, eh, migras, migrantes y, y pandillas. Pero todo está relacionado, bueno, no todo, pero mucha carga tiene que ver con el tema de corrupción. Yo por eso decía, los sistemas políticos no pueden desarrollarse democráticos, y ahí era donde hablábamos con Tani de cómo te afecta en la ciudadanía, porque tenés por un lado anomia social, por el otro lado tenés una juventud o una nueva generación que lo pudimos ver en el 2015, que sabe que la cosa está mal, que no fueron o no vivieron quizás la época de la violencia, pero que saben que hay necesidad de un cambio, pero que tampoco terminan de entender, eh, porque solo lo puedes ver a través de redes sociales. Entonces, yo creo que sí hay, es un punto de partida el, 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 el estudio de Tani para ir profundizando en las clases de, de violencia, porque hay muchas clases de violencia y como te digo, tener que estar discutiendo. Si en Colombia están discutiendo, ahora necesitamos saber qué clase de violencia queremos, porque saben que viene también la violencia hacia líderes sociales por todas las industrias extractivas, más toda la violencia que te traen los exmilitares que tienen sus empresas privadas de seguridad o los paramilitares, ¿verdad? Eso te digo hace 15 días que estuve en la zona del Catatumbo. Gracias. Uh, I wish we had more time. I'm going to let Philip make the final concluding remark. You have to wrap up everything. Um, no pressure, Philip. No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, but if you did want to add any final comment, because we're going to have to wrap up. Einstein said if my life depended upon f solving a problem in the next hour, I'd spend the first 50 minutes getting the question right. And I think Tani's helped us frame the questions. In response to what your, your question, I, th I think um, we can transmit the framework. I think Tani would say the framework just it raises the question. We really need a learning agenda. So Tani was involved, I think, with Ford and other foundations' idea of setting up scholar practitioner learning circles, saying, and, and we even had a meeting at IAF and in other places where he said, let's identify the people who have a, a significant experience from a significant perspective and let's start this dialogue conceptually uh, but with scholar practitioners people who are on the ground at a national level this idea of story action research or doing place-based research at a very local level i don't know of an experiment yet in any of the countries i've worked with where we know what integral work actually looks like on the ground so place-based work Uh, this requires convincing donors to say, back off on telling me exactly what the outcome's going to be in two years. The outcome's going to be answers to the questions that are now clear, and that's valid. We have time. 
We've been doing this 30 de three decades, so we can take a couple years to then think about what have we learned to then transmit approaches. But if we did that at a national level, I think the idea was to have place-based and at the same time a national parallel process that keeps the people who are relevant at the higher level of policy on tap and studying what happens in this place space. So I think there were some really specific steps that were outlined that could be taken up that really will move this work forward. Thank you all very much. I think a good friend of mine always reminds me how we define the problem informs the solutions, and I think that's really important here. I know from a, my perspective, looking at security things, I tend to think about it in terms of criminal networks and all these issues, which I think are relevant, but not the total story, and I appreciate the work that IAF is doing, uh, Helen reminding us of the connections to, to co corruption, which I don't think of as a chronic violence issue, but undoubtedly it's part of it. So thank you all. Thank you to the IAF, the Ford Foundation, to our stellar team of translators, Charlie Roberts, David Spelling, that are hidden back there in the booth. Thank you for your work, our AV team, all, uh, Cindy, for your leadership, and thank you, Gina, for letting us honor your sister uh, in this way. We, we, you, as you can see, we've all learned and grown a lot because of her work, so thank you.